hands are you thank you guys for joining today we will feed your mom one the hill district pittsburgh they call it little harlem the city within a city a mile east of downtown it's a mishmash a melting pot of workers and their kin syrians africans poles and jews irish haitians germans and italians their row homes apartments and shacks jam-packed with between sloping streets hi gloria on April 27, 1945, in a tiny apartment behind Bella's Market, Frederick August Kittle Jr. is born, named for his father, a white German baker who sometimes visits with bread in his hand, but mostly is not around. Now Freddie walks down Willie Avenue with his mother, Daisy Wilson, past barbers, butcher shops, bakeries, people where people speak Italian, Hebrew, or Greek. Their unique voices blending like an orchestra. Their smells, corned beef, lamb, okra, fettuccine. Mm. Hi, I love you listening to this. Thanks, I hope you like, I hope you enjoy it. I'm glad you're enjoying it, so. Summer nights in the backyard, Daisy plays card with the with the neighbors as some strums as a guitar. Their laughter drifting over children, playing dodgeball and stickball, loading the bases. Freddie plays, but he's an observer too, always watching and listening. When night falls and the children are in, called inside, he notices how most of them have a mother and father to tuck them in, but not Freddie. Instead, with a sixth grade education and a job cleaning other people's homes, Daisy reads to him at night, filling him up with stories, words, and hope. If you can read, you can do anything. You can be anything. And that's what period. So, like, the book is like a bunch of poems. And it's like. A lot of pages in here too, so I'm just gonna pick a couple of them. Not like potent, but like kind of hard to explain. We're gonna do act two. Like every other morning, he wakes, dresses, eats. He doesn't mention he's quit school again. Like every other morning, he leaves the house, walks to the corner, and across the street. But this morning, his feet keep going there toward Oakland. I dropped out of school, but I didn't drop out of life. Many blocks later, he arrives at the main branch of the Carnage Public Library. If you could read, you can do anything. That's what mother, who had to quit school to work on crop rows with her mother said. Now walking through these rows, Freddie feels the weight of that story. He turns the corner. In there, Hughes Dunbar Ellison Wright. Books by black writers he found by the ch by chance back at the Hazelwood branch. And there are more W.E.B.D. Boyce, Arna, James Baldwin, Booker T. Washington. A mother load of black literature. A T. T can't talk today, guys. A treasure. He's aching to explode. Inside Ellison's invisible man, he reads, I always tried to go in everyone's way but my own. I have also been called one thing and then another while no one really wished to hear what I call myself. Yes, yes, Freddie whispers back to the book. He reads the words again, slips off his shoes, lets the last line lodge deep in his mind, a tool he will someday pull out again and use. Hmm. A 
very good recipe. He quits his job at the science museum, but he doesn't quit writing. At the soup kitchen, little brothers of the poor, he peels potatoes, boils peas, mop the floor. He watches the men and listens, passing out butter bread, but the voices in his head are from Pittsburgh, jitney drivers whose own lives have come to less than they expected. I'm just tired, can't hardly explain it. You look up one day and all you got is what you ain't spent. At night, he piles up pieces of scrap papers and napkins scribbled with dialogue and scenes, a collage of human voices. He reads them out, crosses out, rearranges. Now he is a cast of black characters spread across his floor, asking August to be sure they will be seen and heard. And we'll do we'll do his last two. Pittsburgh, nineteen eighty two. He wears a white shirt, tweed coat, fancy tie. Daisy wears her best dress. Mother and son get into the jitney of freelance taxi that drives to the hill. Because no downtown taxis will and ride to the where their actors of the theater are performing a play by August Wilson. Back to Minnesota, August hears a new group of voices, a blues singer and her musicians. He writes down what they say and what they do, arranging and rearranging scenes like Brahm making a collage. His next play is finished. October 1984 opens on Broadway in New York City. August watches people crowding into the theater, filling the rows of seats, whispering excitedly. Lights dim, darken, the play begins. Wow. Cycle. He walks two blocks from the restaurant where he's been writing on notepads and sipping coffee. Inside, he brushes the Minnesota slush from his shoes, removes his hat and gloves, shakes out the cold. These hands are almost 40 years old, he thinks. Four times 10 years, four decades. Easy way to slice up your life, though life isn't easy to slice. But in art, everything's a tool and August has a goal. Write one play for each decade of the 20th century, a map of the black experience in America. He's already working on the next one about a hardworking father, a former Negro League baseball player, his wife and son. August spreads the handwriting, handwritten pages across the table. He is back in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, listening. Who's there? What are they saying and why? And that's the end, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the story. This was August Wilson. Reading your mind. It was a good book, guys. I hope you guys take from this book and read me. Can if you can read, you can do anything. And I believe that. And um, that's it for today, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this story, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Okay, don't want to end. Oh. Okay, bye. Can I hug?